Today's Exchange Traded Fridays is sponsored by the U.S. Benchmark Series. The U.S. Benchmark Series makes it easy to invest in the U.S. Treasury market through a series of single Treasury ETFs. With 10 single bond ETFs in the series, investors of all types can invest in specific points along the yield curve, each with the most current on-the-run U.S. Treasury security. For more information on today's sponsor, visit ustreasuryetf.com. That's ustreasuryetf.com. Hi, this is ETF.com's Exchange Traded Fridays podcast, a weekly podcast covering developments in the ETF industry. My name is Sumi Roy, and I'm Senior Analyst for ETF.com. This week, I'm talking with Yang Tang, co-founder of Arch Indices, which just launched its first ETF earlier this month. But before we get into the show, I want to introduce a very special guest, Jeff Benjamin, ETF.com's Wealth Management Editor, who's going to be helping me host today's podcast. Jeff, it's great to be on with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Samit. Thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to uh, having a lot of fun on this podcast, talking to Yang, learning about his uh, new ETF strategy. Likewise. But before we talk to Yang, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, where you came from? Yeah, sure. Uh, I joined ETF.com in August. Before that, I spent uh, a couple of decades at Investment News, where I uh, covered just about everything, uh, investment strategies, practice management, regulatory, all things uh, financial advisors. And uh, looking forward to this opportunity. I've been here for a couple of months at uh, ETF.com. I'm learning a lot. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, it's great to be working with you, Samit, uh, because I've obviously been following you and you and I talked uh, several times before I joined ETF.com because uh, I needed a, a smart person to quote. <laughs> no, absolutely, Jeff. Your perspective has been great for us and it's going to be great on this show uh, because we're going to be talking with Yang Tang, so I think this is a great time to jump into, you know, the interview. Yang, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here, Sumi. Absolutely. Great to have you. So I'd love it, Yang, if we can start by having you tell us about Arch Indices. Why did you create the company and what do you guys do today? Sure, I, I'd love to. Um, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Arch. Uh, we actually have two companies. We have Arch Indices our index company, and then we have a, um, an affiliated investment advisor. Uh, so it was founded by myself and my co-founder, Dr. Jacob Kwong, and really Arch is our passion project. Uh, Jacob and I wanted to build optimized portfolios for investors. Uh, what that means is we define optimized as a portfolio that maximizes a goal while minimizing expected volatility. When we looked at the market, we saw there was a gap uh, in the sense that active management is problematic because the human mind is very prone to bias and error. And I think you see that in a lot of the results of actively managed funds. The current generation of passive indices are actually quite arbitrary. So we saw that almost all passive indices are either market cap or equal weight. Um, there's a few inverse rank and free float out there to round it out. They're static and they target a market exposure. Um, and then, you know, that's just the equity index world. When you look at stuff like bond indices, uh, there was, there's a lot of things. So we won't touch on that yet. We can, go, we can rant about bond indices all day long. Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to build the next generation of passive. And we see that as being transparent, rule-based and dynamic. So there's a common misconception out there that passive indices are just beta products. Passive is really about transparent and systematic asset allocation to reduce errors from human judgment. Um, so when you think about this from an investor perspective, the vast majority of investors invest for a goal. Uh, so when you and I you know, think about our investments, we're thinking about goals. Uh, we're thinking about retirement, we're thinking about college education, we're thinking about maybe saving for a house, we're thinking about our rainy day fund. So when you go to the institutional level, you know, it's the same thing. You know, people invest for asset liability mismatch, people invest for foundation goals, people invest uh, for a wide variety of things. So Jacob and I actually have 
a combined 40 years of capital markets experience. Uh, we work mostly with large institutional investors and private banks on multi-asset solutions. Um, Jacob actually has a PhD in math. He started at Solomon Brothers uh, back in the day in the Yield Book Group, and he worked his way through uh, Solomon, Solomon Smith Barney, and then City. And we ended up working together there for a few years when Jacob and I were both on the Structured Rates Group. Uh, so most of the products we built, you know, at City were goal oriented, and they solve for a specific uh, investor ALM goal. So when you really think about it, investors aren't buying stocks and bonds purely for market exposure. There's an underlying goal beyond that. So that's what we wanted to do. We want to build a goal-oriented product, and that's our vision. Our grand vision is optimize goal-oriented portfolios. Hey, Yang, this is Jeff. I want to ask you about, you, you launched the CTF, uh, Arch Indices VOI Absolute Income ETF, ticker is VWI. I want to hear more about the optimized indexing methodology. I mean, how does this give investors, I think you said you maximize returns and reduce downside volatility? Uh, reduce overall volatility. Okay. Yes, I would love to tell you, uh, you and the listeners more. Um, so we built a proprietary methodology in-house. We call it VOI, uh, Variance Optimized Indexing. This is our portfolio construction uh, process, and it's the backbone for how we weight assets. So when you think about uh, the foundation of portfolio construction and building an optimal portfolio, it's having the right weighting of assets in the portfolio. So that's what VOI does. It's our methodology to build the portfolio. Uh, so VOI takes into account the goal. In this case, uh, VWI is an income ETF. So the goal is dividend yield and uh, bond yields. It takes into account uh, each individual asset volatility, and it takes into account the correlation to the entire portfolio. So what the VOI methodology is solving for is an optimal portfolio that maximizes the goal, in this case, current income, while minimizing uh, expected volatility. Uh, it's really looking to build a portfolio of assets that meet the goal, but have low or negative correlation. Mm -hmm. um, so to talk a little bit more about our uh, ETF, VWI, uh, it uses dividend stocks and 12 bond ETFs to maximize income while minimizing volatility. Uh, and it tracks our VOI for absolute income index. Uh, we started this by we started this construction by looking at dividend stocks that meet the criteria of uh, minimum two billion market cap, minimum three month daily average trading volume of twenty million, a minimum three percent dividend yield, and this is where the term absolute comes from, uh, and a minimum five year regular dividend history. So to note. This is just the available universe of securities, and we don't actually remove any securities except for corporate actions. Um, and on top of that, we chose 12 bond ETFs. 10 of them are actually Vanguard. Uh, and we looked for liquidity, exposure, and cost efficiency in this portfolio construction process. And we only use bond ETFs due to the transaction cost. Uh, VWI dynamically rebalances every quarter to reflect the optimal portfolio in changing market conditions, which I think you know many of the static passive portfolios out there do not have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So in our universe, there is about 450 uh, total available stocks and 12 bond ETFs, but the portfolio really only consists at any given time of 60 to 100 individual stocks and six to nine bond ETFs. Currently, it is 85 stocks and eight ETFs. Um, so in this portfolio process, v VOI actually gives each security a weighting, but most are actually pretty trivial, like under 0.01%. So we apply a 10 basis point minimum weighting threshold, and that's how we get to the portfolio rebalance. Uh, and I would add the portfolio the index has approximately a yield of uh, 6.5%, uh, the ETF is planning monthly distribution and it pays out the ETF or pays out the dividends that are collected in that period. So we expect our first ETF distribution to be late November.
this sounds like a lot of moving parts for, uh, I think you're calling this an indexed tracking strategy, right? Yes. What are the fees? The gross fees is 62 basis points. Um, that's 50 for us. And then we have two basis points of acquired fund cost from the uh, ETFs that we pick. Uh, we have a 10 basis point we fee, uh, fee waiver on for the uh, the foreseeable, you know, 12 to 18 months. So the net fees right now are approximately 52 basis points. Yeah, and, you know, when you talk about your variance optimized methodology, it, it reminds me a lot about another ETF, which is the iShares MSCI USA Min Vol Factory ETF USMV, a very popular ETF. That one also looks at correlations between stocks and building its portfolio. So I'm curious, how does your methodology and your ETF compare to what USMV does? Yeah, so this is a great question. And it's actually a, a very technical subject. Um, so why don't I start with a little bit of background on the optimization? Um, so at USMV, uses uh, the MSCI BARA optimizer. And that's commonly referred to as a matrix optimizer. Um, it uses a matrix optimizing approach uh, and it comes from the title of a white paper uh, a couple of decades ago called Honey, I Shrunk the Covariance Matrix, which was written by a, a quantitative analyst at CS and a professor. Um, so the matrix optimizer, I think, is one of the first optimizers out there, and it's what the majority of the industry uses. Um, we actually have built one in-house as well, so we know the approach quite well. Uh, and I will point out the matrix optimizer is actually quite limiting for a large number of assets due to the calibration and the stability issue you will encounter uh, when you have you know, a large number of assets using this. Um, Secondly, my understanding is this is not a goal-oriented approach, but rather a minimal ball approach. So it's not actually seeking to maximize an output. It's seeking to minimize volatility by using a matrix optimizer. Uh, and as you point out, the correlation between stocks. Um, our approach is actually quite different. We built a proprietary in-house approach we call the building block process. Um, so first, is we optimize for an investor goal. So VWI optimizes specifically for income. Um, so it's not taking a pool of assets and going, pick me the portfolio that is the lowest volatility. It's saying, pick me the portfolio that maxes my, maximizes my income with the lowest volatility. Uh, secondly, our methodology uh, using the building block process is very proprietary and it's a recursive process. So it's different from a matrix optimizer in that the matrix optimizer throws a large number of assets into a covariance matrix. Uh, we use a recursive process and we start with the two least correlated assets in the portfolio. And we continuously add assets into the portfolio until the optimal portfolio is achieved. That's kind of the recursive nature of what we do. Um, we actually, you know, for for the technical uh, crowd out there, we actually uh, target something we call the performance ratio. You can think of it as a sharp ratio type framework, but it uses yield volatility uh, in the way that sharp uses excess returns. Uh, we like our approach a lot better. Uh, we use it in a number of model portfolios that are available on our website, uh, archindices.com. And we are happy to share those with the listeners of this show um, and anyone else that may be interested. Uh, and what's great about our approach is we can customize it for a wide range of parameters. Uh, and we find that our block process is better suited for yield and value oriented strategies. Um, we built some bond model portfolios out there for treasuries that uses treasury ETFs for different parts of the curve, um, a broad bond market uh, portfolio that seeks income from you know, the aggregate US bond market, and also one that's specifically for credit. Yang, you uh, you mentioned some of the weightings. I think you said uh, uh, three percent would be the maximum for any stock in the in the index. But what are the overall weightings um, in in terms of equities versus fixed income? And do you expect that that to move around at all based on market conditions or cycles? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely, Jeff. Uh, we we hundred percent do. Uh, maybe I will make uh, one point. Um, so the three percent is the minimum dividend yield. There is no actual cap per se uh, in the index. So we, we you know we let the VOI methodology pick its optimal portfolio, uh, and you know it, it does move around. You know with the the changing market conditions. Um, so at the moment we're about eighty one percent stocks, uh, 19% bond ETFs. And historically, if you look at the uh, mix of our stocks and bonds, it's been majority stocks, um, you know, which makes intuitive sense given where the bond yields have been the last 18 months. And what's interesting about, you know, the historical rise in bond yields of the last 18 months is it actually came with a really sharp increase in volatility. So from that perspective, the actually historical mix has not changed. Um, because the increase in bond yields actually came with a pretty large increase in bond volatility, uh, you know, which has little effect on the performance ratio. So if you think about what the 30-year bond does today, uh, you know, Jacob and I sat combined 40 years on the bond trading floor. Uh, you know, we can only imagine the adrenaline rush our former colleagues feel uh, trading 30-year bonds these days. Of course, the weightings of the stock portfolio reflect changing market conditions as well. So today, our two biggest holdings are Philip Morris and British American Tobacco. Uh, and that makes a lot of intuitive sense given the volatility of cycl cyclical stocks in the first half of the year. Uh, VWI last rebalanced in August. And before that, you know, uh, some of our larger holdings were chemical names and energy names. Uh, and, you know, if you looked at the volatility uh, versus yield of those names over the past six months, it made a lot of sense that VOI uh, reallocated more into stable consumer names, such as Philip Morris and BTI, and less so into those names. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, obviously a heavy, heavily focused fund for dividend and uh, and appreciation. But what kind? Of, and the fund is obviously brand new. Uh, what kind of yield are you targeting? for, I mean, people, I'm assuming people are going to look at this as an income strategy, right? Yeah, 100% income strategy. Uh, so the portfolio of our underlying index is about 6.5%. Um, you know, historically, it's been maybe high fives, uh, you know, upwards of 7%. So it's actually pretty, pretty steady in that range. Uh, and it's an absolute income uh, approach. So, you know, unlike some of the relative income stuff that targets maybe treasuries plus a spread, we actually target the absolute income, which I think most income investors focus on. Um, and we optimize for current income. So we expect the majority of our, our returns to come from yield, which, you know, is what the income investor seeks out ultim ultimately at the end of the day. And we really like having the majority dividend stock composition, because in addition to the income, it provides potential for capital appreciation as well that you may not find in a preferred stock, uh, you know, or a bond approach. Yang, so, you know, really interesting portfolio you have here. Obviously, you have a combination of dividend stocks and bond ETFs, and, and it sounds like the bond ETFs are there to dampen volatility. And of course, you know, over the past, mo most of the past decade, you know, bonds and stocks have had this negative correlation. So bonds have really been this kind of shock absorber uh, in portfolios. But more recently, we've seen kind of a positive correlation with bonds and stocks moving in the same direction. Does that make it more difficult to dampen volatility uh, in the, using this type of strategy? Uh, you know, actually, it doesn't, um, surprisingly. And I'll talk about, you know, that in a moment. Uh, so when you think about uh, you know, the correlation approach out there. And maybe I'll start by highlighting the index is majority dividend stocks and 19% bond ETFs. And if you look at the year-to-date performance of the index, uh, it's up about 6% year-to-date. And, you know, this is calculated with a third-party agent, uh, BITO. Uh, so, you know, and, and what's really interesting about that is both the dividend stock index and bonds are down year-to-date. So I think that highlights the approach. Uh, of using correlation. And correlation is actually, you know, more than just, uh, you know, stocks and bonds per se. There's correlation between stocks within sectors. There's correlation of stocks within an aggregate uh, 
you know, universe of stocks. And then there's the correlation, as you point out, between bonds and stocks. So, you know, when you think of, you know, I think there's a misconception that correlation is really one big arching concept, but you can break it down into, you know, quite a bit of moving parts. And it's really a pretty deep and complex subject uh, as is volatility. So from a practitioner's perspective, when you construct a portfolio using a correlation approach as VOI does, there's actually a lot you can work with if you build the right framework and methodology. Uh, and as you point out, you know, we, you know, this has been a really tough year. Uh, and I will point out, you know, 2022 was probably a more difficult year in the sense that, you know, a sharp move in correlation is what catches people mm -hmm. off guards. You know, the correlation one uh, tail of it. Uh, you know, luckily, you know, from a historical perspective, those tend to be rare. And, you know, it's more about a sharp move in correlation rather than a correlation per se. Uh, you know, that is kind of the worrisome uh, aspect from a practitioner's perspective. But, you know, from a macro perspective, we're really moving away from a world of structural deflation into structural inflation. Uh, and there is a higher for longer environment out there. How does this uh, strategy fit into a diversified portfolio? And it, it seems like this is the kind of thing that would have done not so well last year. But obviously, a lot of things didn't do well last year. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, we see this really playing a role in helping investors figuring out the right asset allocation. Uh, so if you think about 60-40, um, and as you point out, 60-40, uh, you know, and a lot of these types of things did not do well in 2022, right? The NASDAQ and 30-year bonds were both down 25%. Uh, and, you know, while, you know, the NASDAQ may have not surprised people, uh, it's really the 30-year bond that's probably more surprising in that sense um, from a practitioner's perspective. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, so when you think about it, we see this playing a core part of the portfolio solely because we love the idea of stocks and bonds. But when you think about 60-40, why is a 60 and 40 in a dynamically changing market? Uh, we want to work with investors to find the right number. Um, how much should you be of any given asset at any given time? That's what BOI is solving for. It's solving for getting to the right asset allocation approach. And instead of having a static 60, 40 or any other number, 40, 30, 30, or, you know, whatever you have out there, it's dynamically adjusting itself. So it helps, you know, give the framework to investor of being in these types of things, but adjusting with market conditions. Mm -hmm. Do you see this as a core position or as a, or as an income sleeve? Uh, we see it really as a core income sleeve. Um, and it goes back to the goal-oriented approach. So we see this playing, uh, you know, to start in the income world. Um, you know, outside of that, if the goal is not income, I think, you know, this can still play a core part in the portfolio, but investors have to understand, you know, this is optimizing for income. Uh, so we like it a lot as a core income product. And, you know, we think it can play a lot of roles in a portfolio, but we don't want to speak for investors that may have different goals. Right. Well, it, it obviously is going to be something fun to watch. Um, what uh, what are some of the other strategies that you're working on over there? Uh, yeah, we, we actually have quite a few fun things cooking. Um, you know, Jacob and I are bond guys by background. So bonds are really our passion. Uh, we have some interesting things we're working on in the bond portfolio side. Um, I mentioned earlier our TAC portfolios, which is treasuries across the curve. It uses the VOI methodology to solve uh, what is the right current income using different parts of the treasury sector. So you only own, you know, U.S. Treasury ETFs, futures or bonds, and you're maximizing your income and minimizing volatility there. Uh, we're doing the same approach for the uh, overall bond market. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, we have such a, you know, we have such a problem with some of the bond indices, right? When you think about something like the ag, the ag is 30,000 bonds. Uh, you know, it's utterly untradeable. It's utterly unreplicatable. Uh, so we want to, we're working on some ways to make a more efficient aggregate bond portfolio uh, for investors. And we're looking to apply our VOI portfolio really into uh, small and mid cap strategies too, looking to optimize, you know, a free cash flow yield amongst equities or a, you know, quality balance sheet earnings yield as well too. So there's a lot of potential, I think, to apply our methodology across a wide range of 
ideas and portfolios using a goal-oriented approach and seeking to build the most efficient portfolio to get to that goal. Sounds like you got a lot of interesting things cooking over there, Yang. But we're, we're going to have to leave it there. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. No, and thank you so much, uh, Sumit and Jeff, for having me on the show. Um, you know, as someone new to the ETF industry, I've listened to, to this podcast regularly, and it's just a truly an honor to be on here. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find this and all other Exchange Traded Fighters episodes on ETF.com or on any major podcast platform. See you next week. Today's Exchange Traded Fridays is sponsored by the U.S. Benchmark Series. The U.S. Benchmark Series makes it easy to invest in the U.S. Treasury market through a series of single Treasury ETFs. With 10 single bond ETFs in the series, investors of all types can invest in specific points along the yield curve, each with the most current on-the-run U.S. Treasury security. For more information on today's sponsor, visit ustreasuryetf.com. That's us treasuryetf.com.